Also in the hymnal, number 27, Come, O Creator Spirit, come. Number 27. Now I'm inviting Eric Zare to come up and join me if we turn in our hymnal to number 647. We've sung this before here in our worship, uh, and we're going to do it again this morning in worship, but I'm going to give us a chance to learn the Spanish, 647 in the hymnal. Eric and I will sing it through once, the Spanish, and then I'm going to invite all of you to join us. And I just want to point out, if this is new to you, uh, sometimes in Spanish songs, there are two syllables combined into one note. So wherever you see a, a little tie sy symbol under there, you have to go right away to the second syllable for it to fit into the music.
We'll have another crack at that in the worship service. Thank you. And now in the Sing the, Sing the Journey, the green books, let's turn to uh, number 52, Jesus Help Us Live in Peace, number 52. We'll sing the refrain, verse 1, verse 2, and the refrain.
Grace and peace to you in the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Welcome this September Sunday morning to College Mennonite Church worship. We are glad that all of you are joining together here and also via radio, telecast, live stream. Welcome to college students that may be with us today, and we invite you to join in the College Age Sunday School class following worship. Whether you are thirsting for God's presence or you are filled with joy, whether you are content at heart or troubled in spirit, you are each welcomed here. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. We gather as God's many children. We gather to grow in faith, unity, and purpose. We come together in humility. How good a thing it is when God's people grow and live together in unity. We come aware of differences, but together in patience and gentleness. We prepare our hearts to set about the work of being one people, one people in the inclusive body of Christ, ministering in love. We follow the example of Christ. Christ calls us to encourage and uphold one another. Christ calls us to love deeply, offer mercy, and welcome genuinely. We come seeking to be one church with one baptism, one hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. How good a thing it is when God's people grow and live together in unity. Please turn to number 12 in the Blue Hymnal of Worship book. Come, let us all unite to sing, and please stand as you feel led.
also in the hymnal number 647. 647, and we'll sing verse 1 in English, then verse 1 in Spanish, and then verse 2 in English. We come in gratitude today because God knows our needs, hears our prayers, and is active in our lives and throughout this big white world. Today we especially name in our prayers Will and Shar Kanegi and their family as Willie's sister, Bonnie Nguyen-Schwander, died this week in Kidron, Ohio and Norma and Gary Keister and family as Norma's mother died last weekend in Canada at the age of 101. We also lift up Nancy Peachy Bontrager and her husband, Mary Ann Beth Bontrager's stepmother as she had heart bypass surgery yesterday and is recovering. And Arlen and Helen Claussen's son-in-law, Mike Lambright, as he is at St. Vincent's Heart Hospital in Indianapolis. As well, we pray for Mary White, as she has recently learned of a recurrence of cancer showing up in one of her lungs. As I offer the words, God of us all, I invite you to join in saying the words, Hear your people. Please feel free to offer these words aloud in whatever language you feel most comfortable doing so. Please join with me in prayer. Gracious God, on this beautiful September morning, we are grateful to be gathered freely, uniting our prayers, honoring our relationship with you. 
We know our longing is known to you and our sighing is not hidden from you. You comfort your people. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. For Dorothy Yoder and Helen Bomberger, as each recover from shingles, give them comfort and renewed strength. We thank you for the healing that is already taking place. For Mary White and her fiance Brent, give them courage in the face of cancer. Give wisdom and insight to those caring for Mary as to what course of treatment and care will be best. We lift to you Nancy Peachy Bontrager and Mike Lambright as each are dealing with issues of their heart. Grant them healing, uphold their families. For several in our family of faith who are recovering from joint surgeries or different illnesses, as each find themselves in different points of healing, bring strength and patience. And for those who grieve, Willie and Shar Kanegi, Gary and Norma Keister, Emma Miller's family, and others, bring your comfort. Remind each one of your abiding presence amidst waves of grief. God of us all, hear your people. God, you are near. You are the God of our relationships. We pray for our families, our community, and our neighbors. As September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we remember those in our family of faith who have been touched by childhood cancer. Enfold them, strengthen them. For those struggling in broken or hurting relationships, bring your spirit to bear, offering strength and encouragement, bringing your wisdom and guidance as each one seeks healing going forward. For those in our community who are afraid to go about their daily lives for fear of discrimination or violence or deportation, let each know that we can cast our fear and anxiety upon you. Bring understanding, compassion, and humanity where it is needed most. For those who are incarcerated at the Elkhart County Jail or in prisons throughout our state and country, remind these dear ones of their precious humanity in your eyes. Make your presence and your power known. God of us all, hear your people. God, you come to us with the good news of peace. We pray for the church in all places that we may be one. God of us all, hear your people. God, as you listen, we offer other concerns we carry in our hearts that are unspoken. If they need to be spoken, give us people in our lives to listen. Give us courage to share. God of us all, 
hear your people. Your love and your mercy, dear God, reaches to the ends of the earth. We pray for the world, especially for those who are suffering. God of us all, hear your people. Gracious God, holding tenderly all things human, you became one of us, and we are ever grateful for this gift. Help us to join you and join together in the hard and holy work of releasing peace on earth. In el nombre de Jesús Ramos, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to turn in your green Sing the Journey books to number 32, If You Believe and I Believe. Children, I invite you to come forward to the circle for a special time of sharing from Talasha and some helpers. Good morning. I have a couple friends here. Do you know Jonah and Sarah? Some of you already know them. They're pretty familiar faces here. They are going to uh, do a little game right now. You see all these fun things behind me? Well, Jonah and Sarah are going to do something with those. Before worship, they each figured out exactly how they want those to be set up. They both know exactly how they want their scene to be set with all of these props behind me. And they are going to arrange those props now while Beth plays some music for us. Now, it's going to be very tempting for you to help them, but no helping them, okay? They have to do this on their own. Got it? Okay, Jonah and Sarah, Beth, you ready? When the music starts, you start, and when it stops, you stop.
Sarah, does it look the way you want it to? No. Jonah, does it look the way you want it to? Nope. So all that work, and neither of you got things to look the way that you want them to. Why not? Yeah. They both wanted, they both wanted, it, to look a they both wanted it to look a different way. Yeah. You know, I do this game with my students um, in theater, and often we, we do it a little bit longer, and by the end, they're not being quite as nice to each other. They'll start pulling things from each other. It gets a little bit crazy. But this is what happens in conflict. Usually we have conflict because we want different things. And they didn't, have, they didn't have a common purpose, did they? They didn't have something they were both trying to do. They, they didn't share a vision, we might say sometimes. Yeah. Um, today we are beginning a new series called Unity. Do you know what unity is? That's a word we use sometimes in church. Um, and we use it sometimes elsewhere too, but it is a fairly churchy word. And unity does not mean that everyone is the same. Unity does not mean that everyone agrees. But unity does mean that we're all pulling in the same direction. We all have a common purpose. So if these two had been able to share a vision, if they had, if they had kind of known a general way that they both wanted things to look in the end, do you think they could have gotten things to look the way they wanted to? It's not a hard question, right? Yeah, they could have done that. They may have gone about it in slightly different ways, but they could have figured it out. It's hard to have unity when we're not pulling in the same direction, when we have different ideas of the, the way we want things to look. We're not going to talk about how to fix this problem that they had today. We're going to get to that in future weeks. But we're going to kind of leave it hanging today. We'll keep talking over the next few weeks about how we can do better and how we can live in unity, how we can do this without having a prop fight like they just did. All right, let's pray together. God, we don't always agree, and we don't even always have the same picture in mind. We don't all pull in the same direction. Help us learn to live in unity and to pull together toward a common purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. You may get your worship bags and go back to your seats. And if you have a prop sitting close to you, maybe bring it up here so we can put them all away. In our hymnal, number 511, God Who Touches Earth With Beauty, number 511.
Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader, will be leading us in our scripture and sermon this morning. Please join with me in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity for Phil to share with us today. Thank you for his faithfulness in study and prayer and use his voice to offer the message or messages we are to receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, Are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. The only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each, for we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. The... uh, Harvard evolutionary psychologist. I always worry about starting a sermon with the words the Harvard evolutionary psychologist. That's really an attention grabber, right? It's it's like uh, I should should, uh, hold up a sign this is nap time or something. But this is interesting, trust me. So the Harvard evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker wrote a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. I think it was on the bestseller list, I don't know, some 10 or 15 years ago. Anybody read that book? By any chance? One person? Did one person read that book? John, did you read that book? You didn't read that book. I kind of count on you to read those kind of books. Um, Well, the thesis of the book is pretty simple, and it's this, that human beings over the, the course of our existence have gotten progressively less violent. I put it another way, you might say we've gotten progressively peaceful from the early days of human communities, so those early hunter-gatherer, cave-dwelling sorts of days, up to the present, it's been a progression of becoming less violent. Now, this is a controversial idea. Stephen Pinker's ideas are controversial. This book is controversial, and maybe we'll touch on that a little bit. But I think there's something useful in this book as we begin thinking about unity. So the the, the, the earliest human communities were these tight, closely knit bands of 150 people or less small groups of 150 people or less, and these people loved each other. They would die for each other. Everyone was equal in status, and everyone shared according to each as they had 
need. No one became wealthy and power, powerful rel, 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 relative to the other, serving their own needs, but all served the interests of the group, of the common purpose. They were unified. There was unity in these small groups of early humans. And in case you didn't notice, I'm drawing some hooks for you to the text and to the Gospels, to the New Testament, and its description of the nature of unity. So the problem, uh, according to Steven Pinker, came uh, not within these groups, which were relatively peaceful, but between and among the different groups. Stephen Pinker says, he asserts, right, this is his assertion, uh, and you can, you can look this up and research this if you're so inclined, but his assertion is that if you were on a trail walking someplace and you encountered somebody that you didn't know, you had to kill that person. You were obligated to kill that person. This person was a stranger, and you had absolutely no way to think about having a relationship with that person. It was a fight to the death. Now, what were they fighting for? I, I don't know. Some people might say relatively scarce resources as groups of people encountered each other um, in, in, in the forest and were fighting over food that was there or opportunities for shelter, a cave. I don't know. But the idea is that within these close-knit groups, there was love, genuine love, as we might talk about it as Christians, and there was genuine unity. But outside these groups, with the outsider people and the outsider groups, there was enmity. There was violence, and there was war. Now, we are beginning uh, a series, the, a six-part series, and I will be preaching five sermons in this series on the theme of unity. It, it is a Christian theme, a Christian topic. Talash has suggested that this is sort of churchy language, unity. And I think we are aware uh, that there's a lot of disunity in churches, and a lot of disunity in the church broadly. They were fighting over stuff, all kinds of different stuff. So how do we think about unity? And one of the things that we can do is we can go back to the New Testament and we can learn that we are not unique historically, that church people have been fighting with each other from the very beginning. From the very beginning, we've been fighting with each other. And different groups within the Christian, the broader Christian community have been fighting with each other. Paul's vision, and, I, and this is going to be a theme woven through this series, Paul's vision is that the kind of love and commitment and unity exhibited in those close-knit early groups, might become universal. That God's love is for everybody and that it, it is the common purpose of the church to embody that love. Now that's easy said and not so hard done and that's why we have 1 Corinthians. And that's why Paul speaks so sharply to them about their divisions. Corinth, the city of Corinth, where the Corinthians lived, was at a place in Greece called the Isthmus. That's very hard. That's a very hard word to say. The Isthmus of Corinth. Now, an Isthmus is a, you know is a piece of land that's that divides two pieces of waters. And if you look at your uh, geography of Greece. There is this very, very narrow, narrow, narrow strip of land. It's just hardly... Bob, how wide is that land? You know, you know this. Well, how wide is the Isthmus of Corinth? Maybe a kilometer. This very, very narrow piece of land where the main body of the Greek peninsula 
connects with a Peloponnesian peninsula. And Corinth is at that spot. And one of the things about these natural kind of places like that is that, is that people travel through them. They become major routes of trade, and there was a canal built there. So you could go from the Adriatic Sea and points east in the Roman Empire, and you would go through the Isthmus of Corinth over to Rome and to, points, and to Italy and points west. The major tra trade route. So what, what do we know about communities that are major trade routes? Well, you end up with lots of people and lots of different kinds of people from all walks of life, from all strata of society, from all over the Roman Empire. You have a polyglot community and a polycultural community. Is there no better place for Paul to test his vision that all peoples can be one in Christ, that we might experience unity no matter what our job is, no matter what language we speak, no matter where we come from, that we can be one, sharing in the love and unity of Christ? What Paul discovers is that the people are jealous and quarreling. They're jealous and quarreling. They're doing what people do. And he's frustrated. And Paul is frustrated. And, he's, and he says, listen, listen to me. We, we're trying to be one here. We're trying to have a, we're, we're trying to work together for a common purpose. And here you are with your jealousy and your quarreling. These words that we have from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 are, not, are, are, are kind of sharp, but there are some sharper words that Paul has to say to the Corinthians. He's very frustrated with their arguing, with their division, with their disunity. Now, uh, Steven Pinker, back to Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker's idea about why humans have become less violent through the, through the millennia of human existence is that the state emerged and came to have a monopoly on violence. So you, you understand that? The state emerged as a powerful entity to put a lid on violence. But you're not going to argue with each other because if you do, uh, this is going to happen to you because we are in charge here. And we're going to make sure that the roads are safe and we're going to make sure that there's no piracy on the seas and, and we're going to make sure that you all don't disrupt society in the daily functioning, regular functioning of society. And we're going to do that because we have a monopoly on violence. We have an army. We have uh, soldiers who can police uh, the, the city. And this is the way it is. Uh, and in Paul's day, and in the time of Christ, it was called Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome was powerful. Rome was in charge. And Rome asserted control from above. And so Stephen Pinker's theory is that as these civilizations and these states emerged with a monopoly on violence, you, you, you created peace. You enforced peace. You controlled the violence. You put a lid on the violence. And this belief was very strong. I mean, the, the, Roman, the Romans had a very strong sense that this, is what they were, that this is what they were doing. They were bringing peace. They were enforcing a kind of peace on their empire. They were squashing divisions. One of the things I think Pinker gets wrong in his theory about the reduction of human violence over the years is that he ignores the structural violence, if you will, that comes with a very hierarchical organization like the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, there were haves 
and have-nots. And if you were a have-not, your life was miserable. The, the imperial power pressed down upon you, weighed down upon you, oppressed you form of violence. There are some numbers that say maybe more than half the people in certain parts of the Roman Empire were slaves. That doesn't sound nonviolent to me. That sounds like lots of violence to me. That's Pax Romana. That's not the idea that God's love is for everybody. That's not the idea that each person is of worth and dignity. That's not the idea that I owe to every person my love and allegiance. That some people are better than others. And that's a form of violence. And Paul's vision for the church at Corinth and for Christian community is not that. Paul's vision is Pax Christi. Paul's vision is that peace emerges from God's love for everyone, God's universal love, God's love for everyone. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love for everyone, not just the privileged few, not just the people in my family, not just the people who have the same kind of job as me, but everyone. God's love is for everyone. And by living together in peace with love for each other and embodying God's love for the world, we live as one people. We live in unity. A very different vision than the vision of Pax Romana. As I've been thinking about this, this, uh, this series, this, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan keeps coming back to me. It just keeps coming back to me. This Samaritan, this outsider, this person that you wouldn't want anything to do with, that you would want to avoid if you were a good Jew, becomes the one who embodies God's love. That's disruptive, it's a dis like parables are, it's disruptive. It's a disruptive story. But what it suggests to us is that our in-group, out-group way of thinking maybe isn't the way we ought to be thinking. It suggests to us that the kind of love I show for those dearest to me, for those closest to me, my friends and my family, is the kind of love that I am obligated as a Christian to show to everybody. You hear that? That's a pretty, that's a pretty high bar, isn't it? That's pretty, it's pretty challenging to do that. But that's the vision of the church. And as I've been thinking about this, and as I've been reflecting on this text, it's occurred to me that I can't do that. I can't do that. I cannot possibly love every single person on this planet the way that I love my wife, or the way that I love my children, or the way that I love my parents. I can't do it. Can you? Can any of you do that? Each of you? Have you done that? How do you do that? I don't think, we, I, don't think I can do it. But I think that we can. I think that we can do it together as God's people, as the church. And this is where unity comes in. One people, the body of Christ, embodying God's love for the world. I can't. I can't possibly love everybody as Christ loved. But we can. 
together do that? And that's what I want to explore in the weeks ahead in this series. Paul leaves us in this text with two metaphors. You are God's field. You are God's building. You are laborers working together for a common purpose. Paul's words, working together for a common purpose. This field and this building is a unity dedicated to expressing God's love for all people. May we be one in Christ. Amen. In the green, sing the journey book. Uh, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. Yes, it is. Sing the journey. The green books, number 67. Let there be light, Lord God of hosts. Number 67. These are familiar words to a familiar tune, but the two don't usually go together. So maybe by singing this, we'll think of the words in a new way. This time we will continue in worship by the sharing of our tithes and offerings. I invite you to come forward and place your offering in the basket. Also note that it is a My Coins Count Sunday, our coin offering for the Michiana Mennonite Relief Sale coming up uh, in a few weeks. Please come and share your offering, and if you do not want to come forward, you may place your offering in the offering plate.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have equipped us, you have empowered us to be your people here in this place and for the whole world. We ask that these gifts that we return to you be used to make us one with each other, one with you, and one in ministry to all the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the green book, number 78, Sizo Hamba Naye, number 78. now in gentleness, patience, and humility with Christ as your guide. Go in gratitude and rejoicing that we are one body as God's church. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.